And that's what we're talking about. Jesus' accomplishment of God's plan of redemption. And we have to ask ourselves, and, and uh, many, even in Reformed theological circles, uh, ask the question, how does God redeem? And they answer it this way. Well, there was a time when he made a lot of promises to God, uh, promises of God to Israel, uh, but now that kind of morphed down into one common salvation, and that's true, it's one common salvation, which obliterates all distingu- distinctions so that there's just simply uh, being saved in Christ, and God is not particularly glorify- glorified to redeem Israel as Israel and the Gentiles as the Gentiles. That has been the majority view in Christian circles since about the 4th century. Uh, so that raises the question, two questions that I think that are important. One is lesser. One would be, um, well, then what was the view before that was the consensus, closer to apostolic times? And that view was that God redeems Israel as Israel and uh, the nations as the nations, particularly for His glory. Uh, if that wasn't the, the consensus view that was uh, taught because premillennialism, that the idea that Jesus would come back and set up his kingdom on earth uh, was the view of those who are most related to studying directly under the apostles. The other question, though, that's most important is a result of applying our understanding of how we get truth. And the short form of that is that God is the source of truth. He's given us revealed truth in the Bible we take the Bible and we get all the relevant information that informs our system of belief. And we, uh, as we do that, we ask ourselves, what, what have other Christians said throughout the centuries? Uh, we're, we're, we don't want to be ignorant of that. And we look at all the circumstances. We have a system of belief and then we live that out. So the question is, well, what does the Bible say? And I hope you're getting the idea that the Bible nowhere says that God has chosen that he will redeem people regardless of who they are because who they are brings him no particularly gl- particular glory. In other words, it does not glorify him. He has no interest in redeeming women as women and men as men or slaves as slaves and free as free or Jews as Jews and Gentiles as Gentiles. But in fact, the Bible says the opposite over and over and over and over again. Uh, What we have in common is not our lack of any distinction. What we have in common is not that God has stripped away our maleness or our femaleness or our socioeconomic status or whether we're Jew or Gentile. He has not stripped that away. But from that vast sea of diversity, he has established one common salvation So that from everywhere out there, whatever the diversity is, there is one claim. Jesus paid it all. And that's what that's what men say. And that's what women say. And that's what Jews say. And that's what Gentiles say. And that is the plan of God as revealed in Scripture. And you say, and why is this important? It's important because we need to know what has God said? What is God doing And right now, we talked about the opportunity we particularly have to proclaim the gospel. There's no better uh, question to get that discussion started than what's going on. What's going on? Things are different in June 2020 than they were in January 2020. Uh, Anybody can see that. What's the answer to that that question? We go to the scripture. And it turns out we get, as we put all the biblical data together, a timeline of God's plan. And we can see that. Uh, and, and the most crucial aspect is, what is God's plan of redemption? Is it, as it was stated in the Old Testament books, as we call them, to redeem Israel and the nations? Or is it now just Israel is kind of absorbed in the nations and there's just... Christian, God saves you a Christian, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're the same, there's no distinction, that doesn't bring glory to God. Well, the opposite is true. We're we're going to have finished more than 50 passages that that tell us that God is making one flock, one people, out of two folds. And each one of those folds is on purpose. Just to remind ourselves of this, uh, Isaiah 49, 5, and 6 is maybe the best, clearest 
uh, passage to see, to remember what is it we're looking at, God's plan of redemption. There's no better source for God's plan of redemption than the Redeemer Himself. This passage is the second servant song. That's what scholars have called it. There are four servant songs have to do with the servant of Yahweh, the servant of the Lord, the, the Messiah. And the Messiah is on record here telling us what God said to him. Now, he first in verse five says why he was formed in the womb. That's the incarnation. Why did the incarnation happen? 49 five tells us that. Now Yahweh says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant. And here are the purpose statements to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. All right, that's not hard to understand, right? We can all follow that flow. He formed me in the womb. That's the incarnation. And here's the reason to bring Jacob back and that Israel might be gathered to him. Now, if this is the only verse we have. We might say, okay, so the grafting in just kind of removes all the distinctions. It's just one grafting in that we read about there in Romans. And so there's just, God doesn't think anymore about those distinctions. Except after he says, I am honored in the eyes of Yahweh and my God has become my strength. Which, by, by the way, shows that God honors him because of his form being formed in the womb to bring Jacob back and to uh, gather Israel. Verse 6, the Messiah tells us that God said something else. God said this, he says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. Now, there's nothing in those verses in that verse so far that makes it look like he's decided, you know what? I don't like that plan anymore. Scrap that. I'm going to do something else with you. That's not what we have going on. What we have is not only is he going to do what he was formed to do, but there's another thing that he's going to do in addition to that. What is that? I will make you as a light for the nations. That's the word for Gentiles. That my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So now we see that God has, give, has created, has the idea of the, end of the incarnation, the purpose of the incarnation, the reason uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us was to bring, uh, to re, to, uh, bring Jacob back to raise up the tribes of Jacob, that Israel might be gathered to him, to bring back the preserved of Israel. That's what, that's what he did. But he's not only going to do that, he's going to fulfill that promise and show that he's a God of faithfulness, but he's also going to show that he's a God everywhere. There is no place on the earth where he is not the only God available and his salvation reaches to the end of the earth. So that's the reasoning. We've been going through. If you haven't been a part of that, I encourage you to look at the last four or five YouTube uh, videos. We're going through a survey of the, the concept of not only but also, not only Israel, but also the nations. And today we're going to pick up in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And my goal today is to finish the survey uh, <clears throat> of, of the New Testament. It is a survey. One of the challenges is deciding what verses to show you and what to, to leave out. I think we've hit, we are hitting the, the most clear ones, uh, but you'll probably find that since this is God's plan of redemption, you'll find this throughout Scripture, either implications or references to it. I'm trying to show you some things. Now, remember the, the claim that says, no, he has no plan to redeem Israel, that, that got morphed into just you know, Jesus saves sinners, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. It is true that Jesus saves sinners, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. That's not the question. The question is, does he save them as Jews and as Gentiles? Is he particularly glorified to save them as Jews and as Gentiles? In other words, has he made any promises to Israel as Israel and to the nations as the nation? Is there anywhere where he tells us why he would do it that way? We just read one. But in Matthew 24, this is a very confusing passage because so many people get, uh, get it, misunderstand to whom he's talking, what is the context in which he's talking, Jesus here, and, and they start thinking about the rapture. He's talking to Israel. And I want to show you why. Uh, this is called the Olivet Discourse. And, you know, we're not going to have a, time to, a lot of time today to look at this. But he's speaking to Israel, preparing them for the tribulation. 
Beginning in verse 15, Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. So there's an Israelite prophet talking about an Israelite temple, the Israelite temple. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Is the church located in Judea? The church is not located in Judea, is it? Geographically, where is the church? It's all over the world, right? But Jesus is talking about people who are where? In Judea. He's talking about people who would read the book of Daniel and, and understand what the abomination of desolation is. That means a temple has to be standing for it to be literally fulfilled. Let them flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who's in the field not turn back to get his coat. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days... Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. The Sabbath matters to people who are uh, Jewish. That, that, that's a great... This is a Jewish context, Israelite context. It's not telling us to get ready for the rapture. He's not telling the church to get ready for the rapture. He's telling Israel what has been told to them in Deuteronomy 4.30 when they're told in the latter days there'll be great tribulation, but they'll be delivered what they were told in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. And these are verses that didn't make it on the screen because I, as I, every time I read over it, I find more verses to help you see this. But let me, let me say it. If you want to write it down, you can. Deuteronomy 4, 30. That's way back, right? So when we start seeing the details of the plan from the very beginning, we need to understand that we're not on a plan B. God didn't tweak it. God didn't, God didn't adjust it. He's announced it from the very start. He's carrying it out. Jeremiah 37 refers to the time of Jacob's trouble or distress, but he'll be saved out of it. That's Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Daniel 12, 1 speaks of great tribulation for the people of Israel, and yet Israel will be delivered. Verse 22 in Matthew 24, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect... Those days will be cut, cut short. Um, the elect, they're also referenced in uh, some other verses in Matthew 24, but I also want you to understand how that is related. And, and here's a way to study the Bible. There's little footnotes there. The scholars that have, have, have seen the references, they put little footnotes for us. One of the ones there on this verse in verse 22, the, it's the sake of the elect. The reference is Isaiah 65, 8 and 9. Who are the elect here? It's talking about the elect. And, and here are phrases from that verse that is referenced here. From Jacob, from Judah, my chosen, my servants. Uh, Romans 9, 27 uh, is a reference that's important. We'll, we'll actually be talking about Romans 9. Um, but Romans 9, 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. That's a reference to the elect out of Israel, which is what Jesus is talking about. Paul talked about it too. That quote is from Isaiah 10, 22, and 23. Isaiah 10, 22, and 23 says... Twenty-one. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord uh, Yahweh of hosts will make a full end, as decreed in the midst of all the earth. And if people said, well, that's a return from the Babylonian exile. But the problem is we have Jesus referring to the elect of Israel being redeemed at a future time. And we have Paul Refer, quoting that and applying it to Israel in the future cannot be. If it made reference at, in Isaiah's day to Babylon and the return from the exile, that's great. It has an additional reference if Jesus and Paul are right. Jesus and Paul are right. Okay, <laughs> You can trust them in their interpretation. What I'm showing you, though, is that Jesus is not just telling them, look, just join the church. 
I'm going to start a church, join it. Now, of course, he wants them to. He means for them to. He said, I will build my church. And he did so with Jewish apostles, didn't he? But he also told them in the future, there's a time coming when you're going to see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet of Daniel in the holy place. They weren't saying, what did he mean by that? They knew exactly what he meant. That the temple would be desecrated by somebody who hates God. And when that happens, and he's talking to you people in Judea, this is very clear. This is very clear if you take it for what it says. And so here's Jesus, the Savior of the church, right? Made up of Jews and Gentiles. But he's speaking here to Israel because of their future. You say, was well, that not only but also? It's not in that form, but it's important that we see this because this is a passage that many people try to use and say this is just kind of a universal context where Jesus is just talking to everybody. Yeah, there's Jews there, but he just means to talk to them not as Jews, but just as people. But all of the context shows that he's speaking into an Israelite. And that's the way Paul used, used that too, the idea of the elect, the remnant. And that one of these days, the remnant is going to be such that God destroys all of the non-remnant, and so there's nothing left of Israel but that remnant. And now you can re- it's not a remnant anymore. It's all of them, and all Israel will be saved. That's, that's how that happens. Now then, y'all are listening way too slow. We're going to have to pick up the pace. Matthew chapter 28. Uh, we, won't, we won't get into this a lot, but, but I want you to understand that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is speaking to the Jewish apostles and he tells them to make disciples of all the nations. In Greek, it's pantata ethne. Ethne, you probably hear in that, hopefully the root word ethnic. All the ethnics. Make disciples of all the ethnics. So there's Jesus who obviously has redeemed these Israelites, sending them to go make disciples of the nations. So that that fits very well with not only but also. And that's true of we see it in Mark 16, 15. We see it in Luke 24, 44 to 49. We see it in Acts 1, 6 to 8. I've told you this before, but I've got to remind you. In Luke 24, the Bible says that Jesus told the disciples, this is after his resurrection, he appeared to them. All right, we've got to look at this. I've got to show you. I've got to show you. Otherwise, you'll think, well, you're just, you're just kind of seeing it where it's not there. On the road to Emmaus, do you know that story? Jesus appeared to the disciples. What was it that those people had hoped? That He was, uh, in Luke 24, verse 21, the two disciples are walking. Jesus joins them. They don't know who He is. Here's their confession. This is what they thought. This is what the people who heard Jesus teach and preach thought about Him. Verse 21, We had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. That's what they thought. Let's see if they get corrected. Verse 44, Jesus, He appeared to them after after they went. They were telling Him, we just saw Jesus. And then Jesus appeared to them, and here's what he said. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Okay. Do you see that? That He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures? Here's what I'm telling you. The people in that meeting are in the history of the world the greatest scholars of the books we call the Old Testament to ever exist or ever will exist, humans. Why? Why is that? Because they were smarter than us? No. Because what did Jesus do for them? He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Now, He does that for us through the Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit illuminates our minds. But that's not the same as He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. So before He opened their minds, they said we had thought He was the one to redeem Israel. And by the way, they were right. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. 
Acts 1 verse 3. Talking about Jesus, Acts 1 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, these are people who he had opened their minds about the scriptures, right? These are not, these are not dunces. They may have been before, but they were not after he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And then he taught them about the kingdom. Is that what it says? That's what it says, right? Now listen, most of, the church, most of church history is full of this consensus idea. The kingdom is now. It is happening now. Satan is bound now. We are reigning with Christ now. This is the kingdom. We are in the messianic kingdom. That's the consensus view. Now I have to tell you, nobody who said that was in the group whose minds were opened by Jesus to understand Scripture. This is a different group. They never heard Jesus speak specifically about the kingdom or about the things concerning Himself and the law and the prophets and the writings. But the apostles did, right? Do we agree that Jesus opened their minds to the Scriptures and that He spoke to them about the kingdom of God? All right, then let's look in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Praise God for verse 8 because those of us who reside at what would have been considered the end of the earth from where they were when Jesus said that, aren't we glad that the message got to us? But why would we, upon receiving that message, decide, and by the way, forget all this kingdom restoration to Israel, we don't want that. But the apostles were under the impression after having their minds opened by Scripture and hearing Jesus speak to them about the kingdom of God for 40 days, they thought the only thing left to know is when. That's all that's left to know. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know times and seasons. That the Father has fixed. <laughs> they ask about a time, and He talked about a time that the Father has fixed, but He said, it's not for you to know the time. Here's, what you're, here's your assignment. Jesus, remembering that it was too light a thing that He would only redeem Jacob and Israel, in light of that, that God's salvation might reach to the ends of the earth, sent them to be witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Praise God. Not only, but also. This is not, I have no interest in Israel. I'm only saving people as Christians. I don't care if... He doesn't care if one is Jewish or Gentile in terms of how they are saved and bringing them to Him. But He does particularly receive glory and honor by keeping the promises He made to Israel and showing that His salvation reaches to the end of the earth. See, this is all about the glory of God, not what eschatology club do you prefer. And it has morphed into that in so many contexts, it seems. This is about the glory of God. All right. Mark eleven seventeen, Jesus in Mark eleven seventeen, he was not pleased with what was going on at the temple, and there he quotes Isaiah fifty six seven. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. That's a good indication that he not not just planning on redeeming Israel, right? But but this is a house of prayer for all nations. Did all the nations ever go to Jerusalem during Solomon's temple time? No. But you know what it says in uh, Zephaniah and Zechariah? It says that the nations will come to the temple. So that's got to be in the millennial kingdom. There's not a temple right now, right? But he said it's going to happen. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. I don't think that's happened yet. I don't think there's any way you could historically prove, you know, the world agreed. There was a time when the world agreed. 
I'll tell you where the house of prayer for all the world is. It's in Jerusalem. I don't think that's happened yet, but it's going to. John 10, 16. John 10, 16. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. There's the word also. He's not obliterating the first fold to go get the sheep from the other fold. He's just bringing them also. And they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock, one shepherd. That doesn't obliterate the fact that they come from two different folds, does it? Their unity is not uniformity. Not only, but also. Now, we were talking about this, uh, how um, in Isaiah, the, there's a verse there that, that references John 10, 16, Isaiah 56, 8. And uh, Scott said, it also references John eleven fifty two. So look at John eleven fifty two. This is it. Here's the context. Caiaphas has just said, look. This thing's getting out of hand, yes, but you don't know what you're talking about. Talking about the, the Sanhedrin wringing their hands, concerned over the, 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 the commotion that Jesus is causing. Is it going to draw Rome's attention? What are we going to do? And he says, you don't know what you're talking about, but yeah, it's expedient that one man should die rather than the whole nation bring Rome down on us. Now look what John, the apostle, tells us about that. Verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. In his wrong perspective, he said words that were accurate. It is expedient that one man should die for the nation. And he did. And that's what John is saying. And it's interesting also because he was in the position of high priest that God established. God had him prophesy even though he personally was an unbeliever. It's amazing to see the sovereignty of God, but I want you to see what John says next. 52. Not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now there might be, you might say this, this might reference Jews who are scattered outside of Israel. That's possible but it's hard to imagine that, that this did not take into account, especially on the heels of John 10, referring to has to be Gentiles, the other, the other uh, fold. And the nation is already accounted for, and it doesn't matter if they're geographically in the boundaries or not. They're part of that, Israel, not only but also. See, that those words are in the Bible in multiple places. Not only but also. Now... <clears throat> the book of Acts has several places, but um, let, me, let me tell you some. Now this one's important. This one's important. Acts 2. And I'm, I'm beginning to see my plan dissipate. Listen, here's, here's the plan. We will get to... Uh, there's just a few more passages. After that, we're going to pick back up on the timeline, which is starting with the first event. <laughs> uh, which is the rapture of the church. And we're going to see how particularly that is a different event and it affects, it affects Jews and Gentiles who are in the church, but it does not deal with the salvation of national Israel that God has, that God has uh, promised. Uh, so that's coming. But if we have to finish this survey next week, we will. I hope that you are seeing... God has always planned to do what God does. He, he's never done anything that He has not always planned to do. He, he's told us, and everything that we find that He's doing lines up with exactly what He said He was going to do. There's no contradiction here. It's all consistent. Acts 2, 36-39, we need to understand, Peter was in that group who had his mind opened supernaturally by Jesus, right? He was there, Jesus opened his mind, and he was in that group that said, is it now that you will restore Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 39, this fits with not only but also, this is the end of his Pentecost sermon. Amazingly, in just a period of a few weeks, uh, Peter went from 
too scared to even admit to a servant girl that he was a follower of Jesus. He went from that to full of the Holy Spirit, standing up and opening his mouth to preach the gospel. And here's what he said. The conclusion is verse 36. It's a strong, glorious conclusion to his sermon that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's through his death, burial, and resurrection we have reconciliation with God. He said, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ or Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucify. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Now this phrase far off and near is used in Isaiah 57, 19, referring to the, the comprehensiveness of God's salvation. And it's important because in Ephesians 2, Paul uses that phrase twice in chapter 2 to refer to Gentiles, undeniably. Those who are far off were the Gentiles and those who are near. And the Bible says that God has brought salvation both to those who are near and those who are far off. So it's not only those who are near Israel, close to the promises of God, those who received the word of God through the prophets, but it's also those who are far off to as far away as the end of the earth. Jesus was specific about that, wasn't he? Praise God, not only Israel, but also the nations. Now look what Peter preached in chapter 3 of Acts. Chapter 3, 19 to 21. Now I want to tell you something. If Peter was an amillennialist, if Peter believed there's no, more, there's no more future for national Israel. We need to abandon all of that and just know that there's the church and what we've got coming is this age will end when Jesus comes back. He's going to judge and there's the saved and the lost. The saved go to heaven, the lost go to hell, and then it's the eternal state forever. If that's what he thought, the worst place he could have sent people unqualified would be to the prophets because that's not what the prophets say. There's a reason that all the Israelites had this expectation of a messianic kingdom that would even be geopolitical. Why did they think that? Because that's what God promised them in this place on this mountain. He will return and set foot on the Mount of Olives and he will be king over the, all the earth. Zechariah, And if the Egyptians don't come up to the Feast of Tabernacles, he won't send rain on them. He will rule with a rod of iron. All of these details are not in heaven. There will not be ten people in heaven who are Gentiles who look for a Jew to say, where is God? In heaven, in the eternal state, there won't be any question about where is God. We want you to take us to worship God. That's what it says in Zechariah 8, 20-23. When is that going to happen? It's not going to happen in heaven. It's going to happen on this earth, and it's going to happen during the millennial kingdom. So if Peter was an amillennialist, this is the worst amillennial sermon I've ever heard. It's awful. It's an F. You flunk, Peter. What are you thinking? Do you not know who you're talking to? So he's talking to the men of Israel, which you can see readily. He's in Jerusalem, and he's addressing men of Israel. And, and he's talking to people who have an expectation that the Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem because that's what all the prophets said. That's what they think. If that's not true and they need to be corrected, then somebody representing Jesus needs to say, okay, okay, you, you're taking this literally. Don't take it literally. That's what the words say, but that's not what they mean. But that's not what Peter does here. Instead, he doubles down on it. Ephesians, uh, sorry, Acts 3, 19-21. Repent, therefore. And by the way, do you see in verse 12, he addressed the people, men of Israel. I mean, that's who he's talking to. Verse 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. And he preached the gospel of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection. As a matter of fact, we'll close with this. So let me just read to you this gospel sermon. 
Verse verse 12, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you uh, stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? Remember, this is when he had just said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. And he healed the man in the name of Jesus. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. When he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his... Christ as Messiah should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. See, that's Isaiah 49, 5, right? He was formed to bring, bring Jacob back. He was appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive. Now listen to this. This is his eschatology. He's saying he's going to stay in heaven, right? Whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Peter just told them, you want to know what's going to happen? You know what the details are? Go read the prophets. God's already told you. Do you see what I mean? If all those things aren't going to happen, this is the worst amillennial sermon in the history of amillennial sermons. Go read the prophets. It's going to happen just like they said. And it is going to happen just like they said. And that's going to be a blessing to Israel. And it's going to be a blessing to the world. It's going to be a blessing to all of God's people. And it's going to be uh, God glorifying. It is going to be difficult for those who do not believe. More than difficult. The wrath of God will be poured out. So the question is, how about you? What about you? Are you trusting only in God? The God who fulfills His promises. The God who has fulfilled His promise of salvation in the person and work of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. It's the only hope you have. You can abandon all the other ideas of being good or doing this or doing that. It's what he did. He has accomplished it. That's why he said it is finished when he died. It is done. We're not talking about what you ought to do in order to be saved. We're talking about what Jesus has done. Divine accomplishment. And we're talking about having joy no matter what our circumstances are because God's plan has been announced and decreed and we're in the process of seeing it completely fulfilled. And praise God for that. The future is bright for God and His people. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of Your Word. Thank you for showing us what You plan to do and the unfolding story of it and the words of Scripture. We love you, Lord. If there is anyone here today not trusting in you completely, I pray that you'd save them by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to your glory alone. Thank you for our authority in faith and practice Scripture alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Walter, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria.